Hey, welcome to the 192nd episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Max Fogno, Raul Guerrero, and Making Movies is Hard. I'm Matt Enlo. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and one of us is a little under the weather. <laughs> Boy, I really, I really sound a donut. <laughs> you do. Um, today we have Eric B. Fleischman on the podcast. He is a producer that has made 25 films at this point, probably 26 by the time you hear this podcast. He is a young man that came up through Paramount's In Surge program that was making kind of low-budget genre films, and then he worked for the one and only Jason Blum at Blumhouse. The, the Mr. Jason Blum. He was, I think, employee number four, he says? Yeah, he worked on production of 12 movies in one year there. In as many months. Yeah, he's just uh, really interesting. As we, we will go into his origin story a little bit, kind of how he got to where he got to. But we really end up in kind of my favorite part of the interview, which is where we talk about what movies he's looking for, how people like you, our listeners, could get him your project. And he even has what he calls the development matrix, which is his own not patented way of coming up with great genre film plots. Yeah, he gets pretty in the weeds in terms of how a person should approach creating something and how they can be aggressive in the marketplace and viable in the marketplace and also creatively interesting and inspiring and how to appeal to a producer like him and and what his secret sauce for success is. Yeah, that should be the title of this episode. Secret sauce for successes? <laughs> or, yeah, the film, genre film Matrix. Mm, yeah. yeah, we'll figure it out. You guys already know by now. Yes. I mean, listeners clicked on the episode, so... Right. Well, great. Before we chat with Eric, we are going to tell you about our Patreon real quick. Patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. It's a place where you can go help support us, throw us a couple bucks a month, get into all of our live events for free, which we are working on some cool things coming up. And uh, it's just a way to show us that you appreciate the podcast. And we really appreciate the patrons we have right now and would love to have some more join them before they get too lonely. So again, it's patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. If you're unsure about Patreon, but you do want to help the show out, the other thing you can do is write us an iTunes review. We're at 179 ratings, and we haven't had a review in a while. I would love to read some out loud on the show soon. Yeah, if you uh, ever feel like emailing us, telling us you like the show, send that to us through an iTunes review instead. (laughs) Well, before we hop into our conversation with Eric B. Fleischman, here's a word from our sponsor. Hey, we are here with Daniel McCarthy, the founder and CEO of Musicbed. We were curious, why did you start Musicbed? I was actually a filmmaker as well. You know, I felt like as a filmmaker, I could control almost every aspect of the film. But every time I would hit music, it felt like you were just hitting a brick wall creatively. You know, you were kind of stuck with whatever existed out there and we just felt like there was a better way yeah that totally makes sense i've had that problem where you watch this commercial or something you're like that's so awesome but they're using like you know rolling stone song that i could never afford to buy yeah i mean i mean don't get me wrong right like great music exists i think as an indie filmmaker when we were when we were working on it it's you know when you don't have a couple hundred thousand that's when it becomes more complicated so you know for us it was like it it wasn't that great music didn't exist in the world it was that great music didn't exist accessibly within the budgets that we needed to work within right totally what is it that music bed music has that brings the quality up to that premium level we have a saying at music bed you know it when you hear it i think that the quality difference between what is on music bed and what is other places sometimes it's so hard to put into words you literally just have to hear it to understand you know it's a lot of things for us production value, the melody line, the quality of the song and the hook. We're curating a great roster of music and musicians that works phenomenal for film, which means the song has to help you tell a story. Our clients aren't the average listener. Our clients are cinematic filmmakers and the music that they're pairing with that has to has to help them tell and communicate a story. Thanks so much, man. We want to thank Musicbed again for sponsoring this episode of Just Shoot It. If you want to get a free month of Musicbed subscription or 20% off your next single song license, head to musicbed.com and use the promo code Just Shoot It. All one word. And here's the interview. I and mean, how do you get a job straight out of college Insurg- at a at Paramount? 
So so here's here's he interned the, there for three years. He interned th- so interned there for three years at Paramount. Oh, oh okay. Paramount started in Surge, and for those listening, and that's going to be a hundred percent of everybody because no one seems to. Maybe that one guy's like, I know in Surge. Yeah, no one knows. No one is in Surge. Um, and like, funny enough, I can't seem to find the press announcement about announcing it to begin with. Like, they've kind of. Paramount must have just swept it under the rug and been yeah. like, this never happened. La, la, but la. isn't it, I guess when I remember it, and I could be remembering totally wrong, but pretty much Paranormal Activity came out and then Paramount's like, why are we not making Yeah, well, Paramount, Paramount released it. It was such a success. Paramount's like, we should have a whole division. Adam Goodman said we should have a whole division dedicated towards this. Started in Surge. In Surge's mission statement was 10 films a year at the studio. A million dollars total. So each film gets a hundred thousand dollars to make. That's you're going to make a movie. Only first time filmmakers. So the idea was for the first time in a very long time, the studio system finally was going to sort of open the gates, allow some young filmmakers in, cultivate a system that either works or doesn't work. And let's say if one of those films makes a million point two, it makes up for the rest of the slate of movies. And now you have a great filmmaker in your roster that no one else could get ahead to because you were able to catch them in advance. And there were a handful of successes like that. Like the the system did work, right? Uh, Chronicle was one of the, was an insert movie, wasn't it or no? Chronicle uh, was uh, Fox. Uh, Eight million dollars. Uh, uh, was it really? Mm-hmm. Jesus I- Insurge. Where'd they spend it? Insurge. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the movies that you might remember, uh, the Justin Bieber documentary, mm-hmm. the Katy Perry documentary. Mm-hmm. Those were first time filmmakers? No, those are just documentaries that they acquired and then put the, right. put the title on it. Yeah. Um, why, what, why the focus on first time filmmakers? I'm curious. So the studio adopts this this self preservation mentality, and so what happens is is you have this this growing pool of young filmmakers outside the pearly gates of the studio that are looking for a home that need guidance, and In Surge was the studio's attempt at letting some people in. Right, it's a great idea because the studios do need to start cultivating younger talent. And at the same time, the scariest thing to a studio executive is a first time or second time filmmaker, especially one that doesn't have, uh, you know, a proven financial track record. Right. And so you have you're afraid of this thing for multitude of reasons. And yet this thing, this thing being young Hollywood is inevitable. And so in Surge, even though it didn't work ultimately for a myriad of reasons, had it succeeded, it would have done wonders for the studio anyway so that's what insurge was right it was first time mm-hmm. filmmakers hundred thousand dollars a movie and and you're like i think there's something smart here but i need to find a I would new say that home they were like eric your job is going to be reading because everyone just started flooding our gates with like this new thing called micro budget genre scripts right i was reading i was watching there were movies that were coming in like your next that were about to go to tiff and this is 2011 and I was like, we should, we should buy this movie. And they're like, no. And I was like. Wait, so they were sending you the actual finished movie. We were, we were, we were looking at acquiring movies because you have to remember $100,000 a film. The studio has deals with the DGA, the WGA, mm-hmm. IATSE. Yeah. These are guilds. These are unions. There are minimums in place. You are already at over seven figures before you even get to making the movie. And so it's like, how do you do that with $100,000? My theory on how it could have worked, we'll get into next time. But I went from Insurge and I was like, okay, you know what? There's something here. It didn't really work. I went back to Paramount proper and I had one semester senior year. So I was going to graduate early. I was like, my parents, of course, like any parents, were going to be like, you have to get a job. Sure. I went back to Paramount. I said, I need to work for a producer because I wanted to produce. I went to Paramount. I was like, you know, I was going off the names that USC taught me. I was like, I need to go interview with, with, with. Grazer and Bruckheimer and Silver and the people that I've studied about. And they're like, we have a better idea. I was like, who? Yes, I'm all ears. They're like the guy you made that Paranormal Activity movie. I was like, no. Hey, Oren Pelly? No, Jason Blum. Oh, right. <laughs> I know Oren Pelly. No, Jason Blum. Because, you know, they're, I, they knew I'm looking for producing. Right, right, right. Yeah, I guess I just think of Oren Pelly as the guy that made <laughs> sure, the Paranormal sure, Activity sure, movie. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, the term made, I guess, is uh, <laughs> sure. there's a lot of people who made the movie. Yeah, yeah. There were three people in that house for two weeks. Yes, for, who made the movie yeah. and then someone else came over, bought it, made the movie happen, and yeah, then yeah. Paramount made the movie happen. So, anyway, Jason Blum. So, I joined 
we I think their the first universal deal they had, not the ten year one, but the first one was like the first three year one, was announced like two weeks after I started. And we did twelve movies in twelve months in terms of production. And it was insane. I mean, it was honestly, honestly that insane. That is a first job. That's a that's other. a that's it. Yeah. It, by the way, it. my my former boss at Paramount, who's now at Netflix, but she was a hundred percent correct. She was like, "You want to learn how to produce?" <laughs> she knew more than I did. She knew yeah. what was going to happen. But um, Blumhouse was eye opening. Okay, so clearly you had a track record at that point. How does that get you to where you are today? So at the end of 2013, so after making little after making these three movies, I was like, you know what, I I want to do. I need to start a company. I had, I, I was mm-hmm. going under EBF Productions. It was like whatever, you know. This will, but I needed to have. Uh, I needed a financier because these were all individual financiers, right? I mean, it's a different person per movie. I wanted someone who was in a bankroll, a slate of movies, and so I started talking to people. And you, so you hear that all the time from producers, like, "Oh yeah, we're putting together a slate of movies." Why? Why is it the idea of like you get one hit, like kind of what you're saying yeah, like about insert? I mean, so. yeah, in, in a in a very broad sense, yes, it's financially the most responsible way to to produce because you are raising equity in a pool, and then you're dividing that equity over y number of movies, and so as opposed to you giving me two million dollars and putting it into one movie at four million dollars and hoping it does well. Uh, you're giving me $2 million, I'm going to make 10 movies with other people's money as well, but you're putting $200,000 per movie. That's a pretty small ticket um, to ride. And if one or two or three succeed, then it makes up for the entire slate if there are shortcomings, right? Right. And what Mitigates kind of, risk. What kind of person gives you $2 million? Different kinds of people. Like, um, like rich individuals? <laughs> Or Richard, more like corporations, it, or, I would say, or it, funds. It, it it changes it changes over the years. My my very first company company was this company called Diablo Entertainment, and I started at the end of 2013. I met. Here's a fun story. I was introduced to the landlord of a building where the sales company who had sold Ritual was renting space from. Mm-hmm. There you go, the landlord. Guys, this is why you need to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. Genuinely, though. Landlords just giving you money left and right. But, like, we always joke about being in the building. In this case, it was literally true. You were in the building. I was in the building of the person who eventually was going to be my business partner in Diablo. This guy is Sean. And I sort of pitched him on what I was doing. You know, I was 23. I'd done five feature films. Sort of said, you know, like, and at the time, and now at the point, Blum's name meant something. So right, when I was, right. when I was, eh, well, the you girl know, next door had come out. Yeah. Boy right. next door. Probably. Boy next door. Yeah. Boy, yeah. Um, Different movie. Yeah. I was, you know, I was saying, ah, I, I understand that In Search 2 was still alive or it was on its deathbed maybe at that point, but it was still like I had passed through the two sort of gates of micro budget genre filmmaking. And I was like, I'm here as a, a, a this, this amalgamation, you know, birth child of these. So Sean took a flyer on me and he was like, okay, look, I'll give you 150 grand to produce a movie. I don't care. It has to be a genre movie. You pick something. If you make it and we make money on it, I'll give you more. Fair. Fine. What? I mean, like, whatever. Challenge sure. accepted. And we made it for $150,000, cast uh, Kirby Bliss Blanton, who had just come off like Project X, and a bunch of other actors who were sort of up and coming at the time. Uh, shot it in the house across from my house from college, like mm-hmm. at USC on Menlo. <laughs> sure. And it was like 13 days of night and still to this day, the worst production of my life. But the movie was so much fun for Sean that immediately after he's like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this for like real. Before you even sold it. Yeah. It was like, we wrap production. He's like, he was hooked. Sure. So sure, we started sure. Diablo and it was like, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to just start building out this brand. Exactly. what I was talking about It's We're going to do young Hollywood, first time filmmakers, genre bent movies. And I just started sort of going through my Rolodex of people's like, if, if just like friends, right? Like right. who do I know who's a filmmaker who I can give a chance to. And so we, as Diablo made nine movies together from 2014 to 2000. 2017, 2018, mm-hmm. and no, all no, financed. No, no, no. 2017. So, so, so three years, all fully financed under Diablo by Sean. Sean and, and a group of business partners that we had put together as a slate, 
right? Oh, so, right, right. so we put together a, and these there were there were let's call them two or three. There were technically three slates within the Diablo world, and each slate sort of increased in in price, right? So the first slate was you know three films at you know three hundred k each or two fifty k each. And then it was like three more movies at 500, 600K each. And then, so we sort of, you know, the idea was to build. And within those nine. And how involved are you in the creative stuff? Like you get a script. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a traditional producer, which means from script to screen, yeah. I'm holding your hand the entire way. So you're reading scripts, giving notes. I'm, I, yes, I'm your development executive. Are you looking at the cast and yeah. figuring out how much money they're worth and all no, that stuff? No, these, these movies are not cast contingent. They're concept contingent. So I, I can't bank on having huge, huge, huge stars to, I, you know, I'm not going to have Nicolas Cage in my movie. And I know Nicolas Cage has this dollar value associated in Bulgaria. Right. Right? That's, that's a different business model for different companies. For us, it was more about who's a cool filmmaker and what's a great concept that we can sort of build off of. And let's just create talent what, who can act. What makes you think a filmmaker is cool? I mean, seeing something that they, I would say, one, it's their material their talent that speaks within the material. And I think it's also their mentality about filmmaking. What percentage of these directors also brought you the screenplay? During Diablo, I would say most of them were brought to us in some fashion. Like, So there wasn't a lot of finding a screenplay and then finding the filmmaker. Like, the, the no, 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 no. It was, it was, no, it was like there would be times where we met with filmmakers who had concepts that we, that they pitched us that we then sort of pitch them back another version of and they would go off and write and then we'd go make the movie. And always the the concept has to fit within the budget that you're... 100%. A lot in. 100%. Yeah. Like Carnage Park was something that we were sent, right? Mickey had Carnage Park in his desk. We were supposed to make it after Ritual. But Carnage Park originally was like one woman wandering through the desert aimlessly for like an hour and a half. And I was like, well, okay, we got to put something in here. Um, the alternative was we made this movie called Slight with J.D. Dillard. That, oh, yeah. That, sure. Yeah, yeah. That also went to Sundance same year as Carnage Park. Slight was J.D. came in and pitched a short concept called Slight. And we developed it into a feature. And Did you make that. the short? No. <laughs> no he came thinking, in. He came yeah. in. I was like, why are you making? Why make a short? You can make a feature film. He's like, because no one's going to offer me that. I'm like, well, we are. And then he left and he was like, those guys are, are liars. <laughs> and are you paying him to write the script? No, or? everyone writes on spec, which means they write for free. And then you can you still reserve the right to read the script and be like, no, forget it. Yeah, of course. Of course. So anyway, so, so I, I, they I still think, own the script then. Though, I want right? to pause yeah. this for a second just because I, you hear this all the time. Like people, they just moved to Hollywood. They meet producers. Producers are sure. like, hey, I got this idea. You want to take a stab at a script? And then they go, they write a an outline, they get notes, they write another outline, they get more notes, they do a final outline. They're like, okay, it's pretty good. They write the script, get notes, they write another script. And then the producer's then like, nah. They just don't make the movie. Right. right. And then they're like, I just did all this free work. And then right. I got screwed. All these producers are out right. here to screw you. Right. But like, I feel like you're, this version of the story is like a <laughs> counterpoint to that. Like, hey, you don't always get screwed. <laughs> no. I, we were, and you also own that script at the end. Right. Well, only yeah, only yeah. if you actually make the movie. If not, if not, if we didn't make the movie, JD would own the script. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. If anything, you get a free developed script out of it. No, we. I think to that's answer a, that's to, a really <laughs> interesting yeah. way to view it. Yeah, but to answer <laughs> you get a free developed. Yeah, you get a free developed script. But it's also like people in those scenarios either don't know the producer they're talking to, meaning they don't know if this person is actually making movies or not, or they didn't realize early on that like it wasn't a good fit creatively or that producer is just fully taking advantage of you which is like right. things that i think young hollywood is trying to focus away from you know the goal is not to take advantage of anyone in fact it, the goal is if, if i don't like something from the start i'm going to tell you and i'm not going to engage any further as was like what you're saying is dragging it out and that happens usually with producers who don't know what they're doing Right. Well, like, you see well, a lot know. of times people, producers see potential, but then it just doesn't get to a level yeah, where but, they feel like. But like, I mean, I've been in that scenario too, where like I've seen potential in someone and we'll say, okay, do a, do a three page outline and they can't. Right. And like, that's the end of that. It's right, not like right. go write a script and then I will see if I'm like, it's like, no, no, we, there's preemptive measures that we take. Anyway. So, you know, we meet the filmmaker dancers because the filmmakers sort of came from all over. Right. Um, sometimes we were introduced through agencies sometimes they were through friends sometimes they were friends of friends and we made as diablo we made you know i say a, a healthy lot of movies you know carnage and slight went to sundance we made flower with zoe deutsch they went to tribeca sure we made all about nina Wait, with uh, max winkler 
Yeah. 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 So we made that. Uh, we made All About Nina with Common and Mary Elizabeth Winstead. They went to Tribeca. So at some point, year. you're probably getting a lot of filmmakers coming to you. No. With scripts. No, actually, no. <laughs> uh, because we're not, we're, not, we're not the sexy thing. Yeah, but you had two w- movies at Sundance, a movie at Tribeca. Yeah, but the budget price scared everyone away. Right. right it's like, like they I mean, go to A24 or something. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, I mean, we elevated the budgets as the years went on. We weren't at 250 the entire way through, we did go up in price. Because you have to to afford certain things, but we certainly weren't seen as something that was attractive. It was sort of like a um, flavor of the week right. type 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 mission. I would say that I was on. Right, but I bet half our not half, but a lot of our listeners now are like, oh, like this is the person that I would yeah, want to come. Yeah, I mean to the us. smart people, sure. you know, <laughs> are, are 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 understanding now. Now, of course, we 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 get stuff, but it's fine. I'll give you. To your to your story just a second ago, you'll appreciate this. Then the movie we just wrapped production on was a script that I found online browsing the Blacklist website. Oh man! And for People those are gonna love this yeah, story. for those of you who don't know what the Blacklist is, the Blacklist is two parts. It is a it's a list every year of the best unproduced movies. But on top of that, which I didn't realize, it's also a database that you can search hundreds of thousands of scripts that don't necessarily aren't on the quote-unquote blacklist, but are on the, the Google of blacklist things. But isn't there like a crowd voting also, like kind of... That's, well, that's, how, you get on the, that's how you get on the the prestigious list. Right, right. No, but you, I thought on the website too. No, you, you can just upload post. it. Well, there's still like rankings and things. You can get ranked, but like you can yeah. just upload it. Yeah. You can, anybody can upload. And Tucker Morgan in North Carolina uploaded a script called No Running, I guess a year ago. Good title, Tucker. Yeah, no running, and I we were plowing through the blacklist to like find something, just find something, because we gotta spread the love and the risk everywhere when we're looking for materials. So like this was something I'd learned recently, six months ago, five months ago. I realized you can search on the website. We search, we find no running. I read it. I'm like, this is a great fucking script. I, you know, the I, there's the phone number on the page. I call Tucker. Hi Tucker, this is Eric Fleischman. He goes, hi. I'm like, I'm I'm a film producer in Los Angeles. He goes, like, oh, a real film producer. <laughs> and I was like, oh boy. I was like, are you? Do you live in LA? He goes, yeah, 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 I do. I'm like, I I, I moved here recently. I'm like, well, I loved your script. Does anyone have the rights to it? He goes, no. Well, I'd like to make it. And he goes, uh, okay. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm gonna send you an email. Let's get together and let's and let's and let's let's you know let's just see how we jive and we'll go from there. And he he tells me now that he's like after the phone call he was like this is bullshit this isn't supposed to happen like this right because right. this is like this is like the movie version ha ha hey right uh, we sit down with him we're very much real we attach a director to that movie we we literally just wrapped production a few weeks ago it's wait it's, so how do you find a director so you don't have Tucker direct it Tucker Tucker's a writer at least for now he wanted to write. The director was someone that my head of physical production went to school with, USC grad. His name is Delmar Washington, who had, uh, who uh, I, had, I had heard whisperings of, but then saw his material. He like done like this fucking amazing short that was very much in the same tone and vein as the movie, which is a sci-fi thriller about a young black kid. And I was like, this he knows how to handle this. So that was also funny. We were on set of the movie before. No running uh, earlier this summer, and we bring Delmar to set with Tucker because, like, we sort of like that. He's like, you know, like we're we're interviewing different directors. You should sit down. Everyone's gonna sit down with Tucker, and we're gonna have sort of some sessions with like the director comes in and gives us their pitch based off their time with Tucker. So Delmar comes into this meeting, and for all intents and purposes, he believes he's like coming in, and there's other options in his pitching. Reality, we had outruled everyone immediately, sure. and there was no one else. He's I just wanted to, he's I just wanted to like it. have him go through the motions of yeah, it. Yeah. So he comes to this this Catholic school where we're shooting this witch movie, of course, because uh, that's how it works. <laughs> and um, he comes and sits down, and gives us, gives a great pitch. At the end of it, I was like, I just revealed that like there's actually no one else that you actually have the job. And then walked out of the room to keep monitoring set. And he was, he was, he told me later, like, I was confused because, like, is that it? <laughs> is it just as simple as that? I got like, it. I have to do anything? I was like, no, you, that's you, it. You, 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 you like his pitch? I was like, yeah, it was a good pitch. I was like, we don't hey, you can take a com tech and come watch monitor and hang out for a little bit. He's like, <laughs> she's like, okay. So that's sort of the idea behind how we 
treat these movies. Like, they're special and they're fun. And, like, you getting a greenlit movie should be something that's, like, <gasps> it should come to you as, like, a sure. gift, right? As opposed yeah. to, like, you struggled all your life and you were dragged through the mud. And finally, after years of developing with that producer and 75 drafts, you finally got agreement. And you're like, oh, fine. No, it should be, like, I got something for you. What's yeah, in it? Yeah. It's in the box. What's in the box? I can't tell you. You got to open the box yourself. I just even open it. It should be this really, really fun thing. So, so we. That's how we sort of treat it. Anyway, the point of that is, is that Tucker had that very same experience, which is like, Negroni. He did have to go through rounds of notes, and he was sort of like, "This is a lot of notes." But uh, again, sure. you have someone who it was his first screenplay. This is his very first screenplay. Anyway, so so Diablo was you know was a, a practice in this mm-hmm. model, and we. At some point, you know, Sean and the business partners who sort of ran Diablo were, I would say they're serial investors, right? Diablo was like company six for them. And they started getting into other businesses. And, and it became clear that, you know, my, the speed at which I need to move to function, which is quite fast, um, you know, Sean is double my age mm-hmm. and with a family of three. So it's like, and, 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 and a lot of other businesses to handle. So it's, Right. I think it became clear that I needed to run and he just didn't, it was not that he didn't want to, it's just like, I, he's got so much on his hands. So I left Diablo, I left everything to him because, you know, I, what, he, what am I going to do? You know, he's he, he still wanted to have the production company and he's an attorney and I was like, you know what, I, I really is, is, I'm walking away, the company's not dying, I'm just leaving it. So Diablo still exists and he still runs it. And so what... Are you still kind of playing in the same budget range? Or are you all so over now? The place now it's now? now it's like I would say it's anywhere from like seven hundred to a mil, mm-hmm. right? We're playing in a slightly larger sandbox. And are you still not like cast dependent, more like concept dependent? It's still it's always concept dependent, but now we just sort of there's there's a bit more of a, an emphasis on trying to get at least some people of recognizability in the mm-hmm. movie. But in terms of recogni- recognition, it's like. They're on some TV shows. And like Zoe Deutsch at the time was, she right. had, she had done Vampire Academy. Yeah. It like, you know. It's like still early days yeah, for her. Yeah, it was her, Adam Scott, Tim Heidecker, and Catherine Hahn. Mm-hmm. Catherine Hahn is having a great moment right now with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's not a great example. Is there another? <laughs> you named a bunch of relatives. Okay, like Slight. Slight, yeah, Slight, Jacob yeah. Lattimore, Storm Reed, who then starred in Wrinkle in Time, mm-hmm. who's now who's, who's now in Euphoria, right. and I mean, huge fucking like one of the biggest kid actors, if not the biggest sure. child but we actor. We didn't know at the at that time. At the time, she was she had done an American Doll, doll movie, American right. Girl Doll, whatever those things are called. Yeah, no, there's 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 a lot of successes that come out of those movies in terms of talent, but you know, we obviously wanted to elevate the game and so i you know in this process of trying to think about you know you have to sort of rebrand and mm-hmm. you have to sort of keep the same mission statement um started meeting with financiers again right because you sort of have to have a foundation at some level so started meeting with financiers again and again at this point i have a financial track record i have like a deck a company deck that has all the information of how we operate what the mission statement is again you know which is a, a blessing uh, every time you still mention Blumhouse, it's still like, oh, sure. you know, yeah. and it's funny. It's usually totally the opposite. Better, usually right? people don't know my background. So people come into the meeting and I'm, they'll be like, well, let me tell you, I got a glowing review from Blumhouse. And I'm like, which of the 80 people read it? Ooh. Sure. Yeah. It's like, who are you trying to impress? Um, all the Blumhouse listeners are like, no, <laughs> we will revolt. And we'll you, show him. Are you still working on this concept that some movies will make money and some movies will lose money? No, I'm working on the concept that they all should make money. They should sure. all make money. But you're amortizing across a slate, basically. Right, we're still In, doing slates. Yeah. So, like, we just finished a, I guess it was four films, a four-picture slate with this company called Kodiak Pictures, which is a film finance production company. And we worked with uh, Will Smith. Uh, family office and Mark Forrester and Will Smith have a company called Telepool that we that all sort of joined forces and did a slate of micro budget films. Again, micro budget is sub one for us. Again, without divulging into specifics, mm-hmm. let's just say sub one. Sure. Um, and sub one is under a million. Dollars. Yeah, sub sub one million dollars, below one million dollars. Um, and that slate ended 
in the springtime, but Kodiak has sort of emerged as a really strong partner for us. Mm-hmm. So we've built the new slate, which is a 10 picture slate around them as a financial partner. Um, no Running was film number one on the slate. Mickey Keating's sixth film off season is shooting in January is the mm-hmm. second film. And I contractually have two years to do 10 movies. So <laughs> it's not that bad because I've done 12 in one. With yeah, you're fine. So it's, it's actually fine. Well, this um, is a perfect segue because yeah. we should probably start wrapping up uh, pretty soon. But I, for our listeners at home. Right. This is the question. Right? Yeah. They're how, all like, when will they tell us? How do you, yeah. they get you to want to make their movie? Yeah. Someone's in their car just like ready to pull over to write down. They your have a perfect address. sci-fi horror film. They're just like, I got to work with Eric. I would say if what it's a, if it's a writer director, you have to have something to show for yourself. Something, something visual visual beyond a script right meaning a short a you've directed a music video um a proof of concept something that shows that you have talent so and um you, you're you know you say a short a music video is a body of work important or is it no is it, could it literally be one it, li- it, li- it literally could be a we have greenlit people with a two minute short yeah but it's a really fucking good short really good. yeah um that's how what lo- was that short Lights out. No, I'm teasing. Uh, <laughs> so I would say you have to have material under your belt that shows that you have talent, right? Mm-hmm. That's probably the hardest part for us because usually people are like, well, I've or I've done something, but it's not really that good. And it's like, well, then then you should be focusing more on getting something that's really great. And when you say talent, you mean you're a good visual storyteller, you get good performances, you understand how... Meaning you're making me a dish, and I'm going to eat the dish, and I'm going to say, that's a delicious dish. It could be, you know the ingredients to it. It means like, oh, a little more salt, a little more pepper. I like to use a lot of lemon. Like, whatever it is, it's going to be different person to person. But how important is it for it to feel like an original voice? I would say it's less important about the voice. It's hard to convey your voice in two, three minutes. Right. I'm more interested. Can they build tension? Can they do a scare? Can they pull off a scare? Can do, can they direct actors? Do they know where to put the camera? Like you want to talk mise en scène, right? You, it's that's more important. The, the the taste and everything comes in later when you're developing it and you're getting creative with like because I think that the voice is a natural thing that occurs. And people spend a lot of time thinking about like, well, what's my voice? Is it going to be like Tarantino? Is it going to be like Right. It's and I got I can tell you firsthand watching filmmakers who weren't filmmakers and then became filmmakers, your voice is something that you discover after you've made three movies. Sure. Right. right. Your first movie is not enough to tell you your voice. It your takes second two movie points is to, yeah. to draw a line. And I regret right? using yeah. the word voice because I don't like that word in general. It, it's an intimidating word. But I guess what I meant... Your style, like, even style. Your, right. like, your what, intonation. Well, what I see a lot and what I was trying to organically pull out of you, but I, I'm just going to say it, <laughs> is that a lot of the shorts that we see from like new newer filmmakers are just really cliche. You know, They put the camera in an excellent yeah, place. Just, just the wrote, actors are yeah. great. The music is great. The lighting is great. The cinematog- I mean, but the cinematography, um, almost everything I see is like incredible. You know, yeah. <laughs> the yeah, color yeah. correction. Especially at this what point. What are you guys watching? Send me what you have because yeah. I'm not getting these. You know, uh, but it feels like I've seen it a million There's times no before. There's no electricity to it. Sure. Yeah. I would say, I'm again, I'm less worried about that because I'm usually used to seeing really fucking shitty shorts. So if you send me a really great short that's cliche, I'm going to say, okay, you know what? Let's give you a really great script that pushes you outside your comfort zone and you should be able to succeed. The only negative part is if you send me, here's my really cliche short and here's the very, here's the very cliche follow-up feature version of the short, I'm going to be like, well, I'm immediately passing because you, you don't understand, and this is part two, what is needed in the marketplace. I think as a filmmaker... As a, especially as a writer, no matter where you live, it's super easy. What movies have come out and which ones have done better than the others? You can look that up anywhere, right? People, I meet people who are like, well, I don't live in LA, so it's kind of hard. It's like boxofficemojo.com is not hard to type in to search, oh, 
maybe I shouldn't do torture porn movies, right? Mm-hmm. Gore hasn't been in in years. You can look this stuff up, and yet I'm And are you, you're talking about specifically in genre. this kind of low budget I'm, I'm genre. Sp- yeah, well, forget low budget. I'm saying genre films, right? Because even like Charlie's Angels comes out this past weekend. Well, that's so there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of questions about Charlie's Angels. And but, you're like, that would have... That seems like it would have made money. Sure. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, talk, I'm talking about the, like this space. This space. I'm, uh, yes, of like you're making Lionsgate-y even model. yeah screen gems and yeah. I mean do, look at Doctor Sleep. Did you see Doctor Sleep? No. no. There's a reason you haven't seen Doctor Sleep. Yeah. It's because it's bad. Oh, I heard it was good actually. By people who didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> By your blind friend. Yeah, yeah. The movie. It, we'll get into this later. They were sleeping. The, the movie is. It's bad. It's bad. It's actually bad. Ready Player One did a better job of handling sh- The Shining than <laughs> Doctor Sleep. Ooh. 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 Fighting words, but you, you you watch both, you'll be like, "Well, it's true." Just, anyway, just anyway, it's so yeah. anyway, it's it's having having something to show for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's knowing the marketplace and knowing where there's a demand for types of movies and not. Again, we get cold submissions all the time. I'm sure people listening to this will be like, "I'm going to find their email. I'm going to send them an email." And then this, the third part, the third part is knowing your audience. So I'll get emails that are six pages long with this and I just delete it and no one realizes Wait, that I, I, let's let's dig on that yeah. a little you delete it because it's because it's unprofessional mm-hmm. you don't send a six page email if you're trying to get someone's attention you send a one sentence email yeah because that's how the film industry works right the people in the film industry have no time or at least the, the real people who really work don't have time to read cold submissions that are extremely long, right? So you right. have to understand, if I was someone living in Nebraska and I wa- I had a horror screenplay I wanted to send someone, I have to, again, I have to do my research to understand the mentality of the human being I'm going to talk to. And that is, I'm sending it to a producer. I'm going to assume the producer I'm sending it to is busy. And this busy person doesn't know me. So what do I do? I don't send a very long... Ex- Let's role play real quick. Yes. I'm Eric. You're the person in Arkansas. Okay. Nebraska. This, 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 Nebraska this, is, this is the email? Yeah, yeah. And I, okay. B- 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 oh, my phone's on. What does it say? Dear Mr. Fleischman, even though you don't know me yet, my name is Jim, and I am here to make you your next nope, million next. dollars. Okay. <laughs> All right. What's the good version? Give me the good one. B- b- Hi, Eric. This is uh, how what is this? Hi, Eric. Jim. My my name's Jim. I'm from Nebraska. You don't know me, but I've read a lot about you, and I know what you guys do. I might have a script that's if you're interested. Here's the log line. If it's interest, let me know. If not, all good. That's it. Yeah, that's and it. I read that Perfect. log line, and I bet this is this happens. And I read the log like not a bad log line. Hey, Jim. Nice to meet you. Uh, tell me about a little bit more. Can you send me like a synopsis on it? Yeah. Here you go. Here it is. And I'm like, oh, it's not bad. Okay. Hey, Jim. Send me the script. Send me the script. Oh, Jim, script's not good, but you know what? Really like your taste. If you come up with something else, let us know. Thanks. Usually, that's not what happens. It's usually like, send me the synopsis. Here's the 30-page synopsis. No, right. no, Jim, <laughs> can you send me uh, like a 10-pager? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the 30-pager. Okay. Well, Jim, this is just not for us. Why is it not for you? Well, uh, <laughs> we're not making movies like this, but why not? Here are some examples of why you should make this movie. I'm like... Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, sorry, man. how do I filter and block Jim's email now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's knowing your audience, right? Again, it, people who are in the film industry know it's, it's it's easier almost. Like I could fake an email or not fake. I could email anyone in the film industry, even if they didn't know me, and they would probably respond if my email was literally a sentence or shorter. Sure. Like, hey, man. Hey, man. Good, good running you, into yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, good running into you today. Call me when you can. Here's the office. Yeah. They're most likely going to call. It could, be, it could literally yeah. be Alan Horn at Disney. You wouldn't really would know because it seems like, oh, it, it looks like. It's yeah. like the, just like the Trojan, yeah, horse, must, must Trojan horse, horse of at, emails. It looks yeah, like yeah. an innocent email. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, knowing, it's knowing the audience. It's knowing the marketplace. And again, I think it's knowing yourself too. Let's dig in a little bit on point number two, knowing the marketplace. Just in the, you know, what is it? It's November what? 19th, 2019. Yeah. What are you guys looking for right now? What's the thing where you're like, you said no torture porn. Well, to- well yeah, well, torture, again, torture porn and gore is, hasn't been in for a very long time, it's over. right? Great. It's over. It's over. I think if not things, I mean, things that we're specifically for looking for, but we already are developing. More, more generally. Generally, it's like you, if I were, if, if I were in someone's position listening to this and curious, yeah. you know, okay, let's, for example, look at Blumhouse's movies. Blum's movies are usually either some variation of a haunted house movie or some variation of a home invasion movie. Mm-hmm. Okay, what other movies are like 
haunted house movies. Well, Dr. Sleep is kind of like a haunted house movie. You start realizing there's a lot of movies that fall into the haunted house category. Then you say to yourself, okay, how can I take this haunted haunted house trope and make it something totally different so that it's not doesn't really feel like a haunted house movie, even though I'm going to present it to you as such and you're going to eat it and it's going to taste like one. And that, to me, is the sign of someone who's at least thinking both within the box and without the box because you're saying, okay, I know these films are in style. At least they're not out of style. Um, give you a better example. Uh, a better example is y- if you read Deadline, which, again, for those listening, if you don't know, you should should stop listening and sure. read, yeah, yeah, start reading. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know who we're addressing here. Yeah, I don't know no, to yeah, what no. level. No, no, but that's fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Deadline. Yeah. But you're but you're reading sure. Deadline. You're seeing about movies that are getting announced. And if you were reading this past summer, you saw a lot of movies, TV shows, and YA books about witches. So you know, next summer, a lot of witches coming out. So when the witch craze starts next summer, you're gonna be like, whoa, who would have thought? It's it right in front of you if you're looking. Right. But um, does so, that mean you should avoid witches or should you should embrace witches? It's up to you. If you're in my position, you embrace the witches and you beat everyone to market, which we did. <laughs> so our movie, Witch Hunt, uh, will be to about will be, the impeachment. Will, no, but it's it deal. It's basically it's like Handmaid's Tale with witches mm-hmm. in Trump's America. So the oh, the, ter- the term right. is the term is obviously used, but it's basically imagine a uh, alternate reality where witches exist as like a, a subculture and they're discriminated against. Cool. Super simple, yeah. but we got lucky because we were trying to develop a witch movie for like two years ago because I was like, I just like witches. And then I started reading. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Make it a priority. Mm-hmm. And then we shot it. And so now, yeah, we'll be we'll be done with the film before anyone else is done with theirs, which is good. You stay away, everyone else, yeah, with your yeah. witch movies. What what else? What what else is on the list? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, read the tea leaves for us, Eric. Um, uh, uh, you know, here's what I'll say. I don't want to divulge too much because part of this is my bread sure, and butter. Of course. But if you look at the horror trends over the years, over the decades, horror mirrors what's happening in the news of that decade, right? So and there's there's a great paper on this somewhere, and I don't remember the whole every single decade, but you know, you look at turn of the century, you know, films are sort of starting to get come out come out, you have the thirties. You have monster movies, creature movies as a result of World War One. For the first time ever, you had this information being broadcast into your homes of these larger than life creatures that had to, you had to send armies out to defeat, right? So you get monster movies coming out of that. In the 50s and 60s, you get Cold War, right? And that's where Hitchcock comes out. You know, the inability to trust your neighbor, paranoia thrillers, not knowing who's who, mistaken identity, right? Um, you have the Vietnam War in the 70s. The first time war is being broadcast into your television, what do you also get? Gore and torture porn mm-hmm. and horror films, right? Because people were able to stomach it. And so I think if you consider that and you look at the progress, I think we're sort of entering, we are in a second Cold War right now, which is why movies like Us and Get Out are doing so well. It's because Jordan is tapping into the culture of fear, mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Or even if you look at like Purge and Insidious, it's like you think you have this perfect residential life, but like something but is something out, there out there yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that yeah. you it's, don't want to conform. It's this to. it's this inability to trust. You can't trust the person living next door. And so I think if you if you if you as a filmmaker look at the news and you say, Okay, what's horrifying about this? Plenty. But when you think about that and you say, Okay, well that, let that be a foundation for a concept, mm-hmm. right? Build off of that you're more likely to land with something that's commercial because it's what people are fearing and feeling, right? I think when you see something like Dr. Sleep, the reason it, there's a lot of reasons it didn't work. One is because it's not really a horror film. And two, the concept doesn't really know what itself is, right? And you compare that to, I mean, look at us. I mean, us is a good example. Us is literally the, the epitome of what I'm talking about here. It's this, you don't know who the neighbor are. And not only that, they're you. How yeah. horrifying is that? You are your own enemy. You are the enemy, right? And so I think it's this, there's this element of social consciousness, which is, which is a permeating more and more in horror, which is great and beautiful, and you should. If you have the ability to tell a story in horror, you should use it to talk about something. And we certainly are trying to as much as we can. It doesn't mean every single time. Mickey's movie off season, I would say, is it's not so much about a political socio comic element. It's it's more about an emotional question it asks. 
but you know we have a horror film that deals with beauty standards you know and so it's 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 very much uh knowing what people want which we sort of dissected a little bit knowing that your concept doesn't exist in the marketplace which is also i think again the easiest thing to figure out and the the thing that no one checks because we get all the time uh, it's it follows with drugs and the kids like oh, it's not anything like it. I'm like the characters are all the same name and then he never <laughs> he never replies. Um, we've gotten it's get out with babies. That's a real pitch we got. It, it's actually not like get out and the reason they used it that analogy was that it was socially conscious, which I reminded them you can't. It's not a catch-all. You can't tell me that. Sure. You can't use that movie. Yeah, that's like, just the only socially conscious right. movie that they want right, to reference. Right, right, right. Or it's the Babadook, but with a whole family. I'm like, so it's the the bad version of this movie. <laughs> it defeats. Right. There's no Babadook because yeah, yeah. the husband's alive still. Right. <laughs> there's no grief to be had. So, so people don't really realize when. And again, and I think it's obviously you read stuff. I read stuff. We read so many fucking bad scripts all the time, and I'm always scratching my head. I'm like, again. Why do you represent this person from the from the managerial agent's perspective? Like, why do you represent this person? You, well, I feel bad for you that you have to sling this garbage because it's garbage, and you don't know how to present it, and you don't know how to tell the client this is bad. Go do it again, right? We I think we get a lot of first drafts. Like that's my opinion now. Like when I, I get to send a script from an agent, I'm assuming it's a first or second draft that no one's developed. And it's kind of hard because as an agent, I mean, a manager is going to help develop that project, right? But an agent's job is just to to sell it. Get it, move it from column A to column B, and it's a hard. That's hard to do because a lot of the times you're you're trying to sell something that's garbage, and you sort of know you're just like I don't want to do all this. So uh, you know, as if if I was, and again, by the way, I would say now under Defiant, I'll, most of our films are homegrown. Most of our our films are ideas that we've come up with ourselves, and so I myself had have had to get extremely creative with cultivating sort of like this farm of concepts that like when we when filmmakers come in we pitch them concepts that we want to make and so that requires coming up with stuff of like again i want to do a haunted house movie but i want to do a haunted house movie meaning it can't be family moves into a haunted house and the sure. paranormal shit goes on and then the family gets pulled apart what instead instead of a house it's a hotel yeah exactly instead of a hotel it's a boat it's instead a of a idea. boat it's a it's, um, it's 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 a it's a camp campground it's wait like, so do you have the concept for the haunted house movie or you're saying you want to do one and you ask no we, ha- we actually we actually have three different haunted house movies i would say riffs they're riffs on how ha- one is a haunted house movie for sure with a twist that I've I've looked and I've seen it does not exist, which is amazing. And I don't mean a twist ending. I'm saying there is a much like the purge. Like tweet, the, pur- right, the purge sure. has a twist, uh, has a hook. Right. A hook. Right, Let's right, use the term right. hook. Has a hook. Um, we have a film going in the spring, which is a riff on a haunted house movie. It's a revenge story that takes place around haunted houses, which is great. Again, it's like it's like how can you pull on these? How can I? If I'm going to do a home invasion movie, it's like how can I do? a version where I'm not going to pitch you anything because, but like, but like we have stuff that's like, okay, how do we take, and I will leave you guys with our, our development matrix. Maybe that's a good or bad idea, but there's a system we have to create original concepts that guarantee you original concepts with a pitch that's easy to break and that can be made for a price. So I, I will. Um, yes. Let's take it. I, I will. I will. I will, I will not cut your cars. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this is what you do. This is the guarantee to make original, and it doesn't mean they're going to be super commercial. But if you if you do it right, you can. And you guys will love this. That we can we can do a little practice game right now too. Ooh, this um, is fun. It's a guarantee to get original concepts that gives you not only your pitch, your comps, your log line, but it knows that you you know that you'll be able to make it for a price. So this is how it works. It's as easy as can be. You take a piece of paper, a piece of printer paper. I'm looking at, for those of you not here physically in the room, I'm looking at a piano and I'm looking at a piece of paper just so you can get it. So you take a piece of paper and you fold it longwise, you fold it hot dog, right? Not hamburger. Sure. And you now have two columns column one and column two. Column one, you list your top 20 favorite films of all time. Doesn't matter what they are, 20 films of all time. Films that stories and plots that you know like the back of your hand. Column two are 20 low budget or contained genre movies. And I would say that's a pretty wide net. Like, I would put Looper on there. Okay. I would put... As the low-budget contained yeah, 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 yeah. favorite on, movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On column two. Okay. I put Green Room on there. Because Looper, you can pull a lot from. And again, Loop, 
people get hung up on this because like, well, uh, Primer. Like, no, it doesn't have to be physically sure. a cheap movie. But like, Looper could have been a cheaper movie, right? right? Like, you could have made if Bruce Willis isn't in that movie. It's yeah, like, it's it's so not. Yeah, cheap. exactly. Yeah. So get creative with it. And what you do with with a pencil because you're gonna fuck up at some point. You try to connect anything from column one to anything in column two. And the idea is you're taking the plot from one and the story from the other and laying it on top, right? And so what, if you do it successfully, what you get is, okay, here's my pitch. It's it's this meets this. So I've got Alien and I've got Green Room. Okay, so, well, Alien is still genre, which is sort mm. of hard. I would say column one shouldn't be super genre-y. Oh, shoot, okay. Alien That's, would be a column two. Can column one be like Love Actually or yes. something? Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, okay. Love Actually meets Green Room. Sure, yeah. Okay, Love Actually. I've never seen Love Actually. Okay, um, what about... All the uh, girls are like, ah, what? <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, it's elf. pretty dumb, too. Yeah. Okay, okay great. good. Elf yeah. meets Green Room. Okay, Elf meets Green Room. Okay. And again, sometimes they don't work, sure. but for the sake of this, we'll, we'll try it out. So I, just got, I have not re- seen Green Room, but I way. get real excited. Okay, so I have my pitch. So my, my pitch something should... besides Green Room? No, uh, let's... Have you seen Looper? I've seen Looper, yeah. Yeah, let's do Looper, then. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Elf, this, elf and Looper, yeah. I, this is not a very genre movie, but we'll do it for fun. Yeah. So I'm going to take the plot from Looper. And the okay. story from Elf. Okay? I'm going to merge them together. Okay. So, here it goes. So, the pitch is... the pitch, Here's the pitch. The pitch is it's Elf meets Looper. So, you already have part one done. Right. And hopefully, th- one of those should be a commercially sounding movie, right? You don't have, like, two unknown movies where people are like, huh? It's like, How the West Was One meets, you know... Uh, uh, Swimming with Sharks. And you're like, right. well, yeah. uh, those are not really... Yeah. Okay, Elf meets Looper. In the distant future... Time travel exists, but is only used by Santa Claus mm-hmm. yeah. and his elves. In order and to deliver everything. In, in, order to, in order to deliver everything. It's not really used to travel through time necessarily, but it's almost used to stall it. Um, and it's illegal to use for anyone else. And there's this elf buddy who was adopted sort of on the rougher side, doesn't really get along with the other elves. And he decides to sort of go against protocol. And one night on Christmas while delivering presents, the device goes wrong and an older version of Buddy appears Mm -hmm. from the future and basically tries to kill him and runs away. And Buddy is then needing to spend the rest of this one night over Christmas night sort of letting go of his responsibilities and, of course, causing this mass chaos with Santa Claus, but trying to figure out what, what mystery lies beyond his future self returning back in time to... Uh, prevent uh, mm-hmm. Christmas from happening ever again or something right. like that, right? So, again, there's there's a way to do it. I'll give you the other version. What we do all the time is Titanic meets Insidious. Mm-hmm. I haven't mm-hmm. seen Insidious, unfortunately. You haven't seen Insidious? No. Um, <laughs> Titan- you've seen eight, uh, Sinister? It, it follows. Is that we've both yeah, yeah, it follows. Yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah. so Titanic meets It, fo- it Follows. So I'm going to take the... I'm going to take the plot from It Follows and put it on the story. Uh, no, the story of It Follows and the plot and to, of Titanic. And just, the difference between story and plot in your mind is? Plot is this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Story is like the emotional arc of like what the character is experiencing right. and what their journey is. Okay. Right? right. So the story of Titanic is Jack and Rose fall in love. and uh, Right, yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm going to take the plot of Titanic, which yeah, yeah. is guy gets a ticket, gets on a boat, falls in love, iceberg ship sinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, ship sinks. I'm going to take a story of It Follows. I'm going to put it on top about a girl is lucky enough. The Titanic is taking its maiden voyage. A girl is lucky enough to win a ticket in a, in a, in a gambling game to get on board with her best friend. The, the very first night, uh, she basically gets drunk, and some guy that she's flirting with sort of takes her aside and performs this sort of ritual thing where he ties her in this old-fashioned wheelchair and leaves her Draws there. Draws her in and, charcoal. Yeah, whatever. And like leaves her on the deck as like something starts approaching her, right? And passes cur- this curse along to her. And she's now stuck at sea with this curse as her and her friends that she's made are trying to figure out like, what is it? How do we get away from it? What happens if you, and you know, if you stop moving, it will catch up and it follows you. And you're on this boat with thousands of people. You don't know who you it could be. You see a monster in like a rowboat. Yeah. I'm yeah. coming. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, you know, anyway, you can go on. And then eventually the ice. And then you know, the iceberg. Yeah, the, ice, the iceberg hits, of course, yeah. the, uh, the most pivotal time when, like, she just transferred the curse. And now, like, her friend is fucked and she's fucked and whatever. So. Right. And what you're giving us is just the tip of the iceberg. Right. Sure. 
pun. But anyway, the point is, is like you can you can get creative with those movies. Like I would say a column one movie that I always suggest is Willy Wonka. Because structurally, it's great. Bunch of kids win a contest. There's an eccentric guy. Like the plot is something that you could you could mix with green room. Green also. room is really easy in Willy yeah. Wonka to mix together, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're again, you're you're guaranteeing a genre film, right? So Willy Wonka is always a good one to to throw in there. I think um, Blue Ruins also a good uh, plot one because it's it's a good revenge story, but it's it's unique where it, the revenge happens really early and then it's the fallout. So like you know, imagine if you did or another another good structure one is Don't Breathe, great horror film, right? Sure. Phenomenal film, great one to say. Okay, well, what if it's what if it's these characters fall into the Don't Breathe scenario, but the house is in. Uh, you know, the middle of the Amazon. Yeah, they break in and now they're trapped with right. the person. That right, exactly. Instead of just blind, it's, yeah. a, it's a witch doctor and you're yeah. in the middle of the Amazon and it's this really great location. So it's like, no one's going to know if you can steal it properly. Right, and then you're also going to tweak it. Like you, yeah, you it's going to be your own. That and you're right. like, okay, well, obviously this is Willy Wonka, but then as you before you're done with your three-page outline, it's something totally different. You you start with, again, I always, I'm always in favor of stealing because at least you know it's this is a grounded idea this structurally makes sense the character arcs are easy because i'm stealing these character arcs i'll change it later but at least i'm going into something like i'm building a solid foundation most people skip the foundation part and just i'm going to build the first story of the home on what right. on what what do you even we're working on a script right now and i'm like just watch this one movie just take the plot from the one movie He's like oh, i don't want to because i'm stealing I'm like that's the fucking point steal it <laughs> Just steal it now, at least get it down, and then I will give you notes, or we will give you notes as the company, to change it to make it unique. But, like, at least start with something. Because otherwise it's like, there's a balloon in the air. Can you catch it? What? <laughs> yeah. Right. Why don't you let go of the balloon? <laughs> Just hold on to it for a little bit longer. Anyway, yeah. that's, that's the matrix. And the matrix, again, what people want to hear when you're sending me an email is, it's this meets this. It's, it's called comps, right? Comparables. So this meets this. And, and also just to clarify, once you get further down the line and you figured out what your movie really is, you don't have to say Willy Wonka meets Alien anymore. Do you know what I mean? I still do. I mean, we we were pitching sure, what, when we were casting No if, Running. I guess what I'm saying, if that sounds dumb, if you're going to be embarrassed to explain it. You can. Yeah, because you know what? You, know. you, might, you might find something else. You could be like, right. oh, it was this, but now it's Kill Bill meets. Right, 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 right. Fatal Attraction. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, but you, 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 that pitch is, I mean, when I talk about no running, if you're like, what's it like? I go, it's like science meets the fugitive. People are like, Ooh, that's all I need to say. You get it. Sure. You get it. It's a sci-fi version of the fugitive with aliens. Yeah. Well, even like like Mr. Robot, when you find out that Sam S. Mel's like, yeah, he basically loved Fight Club and he just made a TV show version of Fight Club. Yeah. You're like, even the the Who saw the Joker? I yeah, I, I well, thought. if you've seen King of Comedy, sure. Yeah, have you seen Taxi Driver? That's why I did. Yeah, you've yeah, seen Joker. Actually. It's like but I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no one's really talking about it. it's really yeah. a rip off of. It. No, just, it feels so Scorsese. I mean, yeah, it's Taxi yeah. Driver. It's, yeah, it's Taxi. But I'm saying, like, but no one's like, oh, they just took Taxi Driver. They're like, yeah, yeah. too busy counting a billion dollars sure. in sales. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. so. I think people get really. Um, sensitive about it. it's like i'm an artist i'm an auteur i need to make something really wholly unique it's like you can you you should you can't help it honestly yeah, that well that true it's like you can't be like oh well scorsese made shutter island it's like he made cabinet of the cabinet of dr caligari you just don't realize it like fine go steal an old universal movie from 1942 and go it's remake it like no one's gonna here. fucking know there's pl- yeah. right, universal's library of old 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 movies that are not genre that could be genre is incredible. They have like literally a roster of movies that are, were not horror films. That like, if I pitched you one right now, you'd be like, "That's a horror film." Like, I don't know, they didn't make you it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> Ethel Barrymore, and it's not a horror <laughs> film. Um, right. Anyway, well, so, but yeah, but that that, ma- that matrix that matrix how we develop that uh, again maybe helps people too. It doesn't work 100%. for everyone. Yeah. I always suggest smoking before doing it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, get creative, but like that again. That's the idea. That way. If you're a filmmaker, you're not struggling to think about like, oh, what happens next? Go rewatch Green Room and right. just see what fucking happens next. Do that, and then you can change it from the arm to the foot or whatever later. The point is that moment happens there, and you got right. it down. Yeah, you know? even Jordan Peele talks about. He's like, well, in Funny Games, they yeah, had a in Stepford Wives, golf you're like, club, so I'll do a bad, you know, you yeah, know, it's like it, people do it all the time. I think just younger filmmakers, I think. Apprehensive. Yeah, it's it's like it's like like, there's such a demand to be unique in society today 
such a demand to be unique, which I think is important. But with social media, it's very hard because everyone looks the same at some level. Um, that's another conversation for another time, the homogeny of that. But it's this it's this desire to like, I need to be unique off the bat is no, no, no. It's it's much better. I'd much rather get a really solid script that's that's maybe not wholly unique, but really well written and like flows quickly and has good dialogue and say, you know what? This is well written. It is the Babadook. Like, you just plagiarize the script. <laughs> right. But yeah. Note to self, maybe send if, Eric the Babadook script Yeah, <laughs> but maybe we do something else. You know, so it's it's all it's all good if you can craft a good story. Awesome. Wow. Well, awesome. That's a great, great golden Perfect. nuggets for the end of this interview. Um, shall we hop into unpaid endorsements? Unpaid endorsements. Thematically, I feel great about <laughs> this whole conversation. I swear I picked this before we had the conversation. So it's a two-parter. One, it's like... November it feels pretty Christmassy already, right? Um, and I love watching Christmas movies. Basically, all of December, I'll watch Christmas movies. But part of the fun is in finding ones that are like take place during Christmas, but don't feel too saccharine. So it's been a while since I've watched Gremlins Two: The New Batch, but it's a masterpiece, and I can't wait. Is that Spielberg also? Uh, they're both Joe Dante movies. Actually, oh. Spielberg is the EP on them, oh, okay. um, which is like a beautiful cocktail. But <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember how fucking crazy that movie is. I don't. The first movie is totally like, you know, just kind of like yeah. a creature feature plus Spielberg, basically, yeah, right? sure. The second one basically takes place in Trump Tower. Billy's moved to New York with his girlfriend. They're about to get married. Gizmo comes with them, and they the gremlins get set free in this crazy New York Tower. They're all stuck in there because it's daylight, and they're just waiting for the sun to go down. And like... There's a mall there. There's like a science lab there. There's all sorts of crazy stuff that happens. And so there's like an arachnid gremlin. There's a bat gremlin. There's like a sexy lady gremlin. There's like a stupid. Oh, I know. I, 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 yeah, I've seen the. I don't think I've seen the movie, but I've seen images from Gremlins mm-hmm. too. So it it knows exactly how funny and weird and stupid it right. is. It's actually a really great sequel. Is this where your gremlin fetish came from? Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, that red the the red lipsticks on, on the kissy gr- gremlin horrifying. really especially as a kid I was like this is disgusting <laughs> yeah, <it's horrifying. laughs> someone had to design that You'd be yeah, like yeah, yeah this is good. Yeah, yeah. some guy was like this is a good not idea. only did someone have to design that but somebody had to like reapply moisture to its lips oh my god you know what I mean yeah. like, anyway you put um, lipstick on a gremlin so gremlins too but then the follow up is there's an incredible key and peel sketch about the brainstorming of Gremlins 2, where Jordan Peele, one of the greatest auteurs of this generation, plays a character named Star Magic Jackson Jr. And the whole sketch is just like a bunch of Hollywood writers in a room, and Keegan's like, okay, this movie's going to be really straightforward. We'll just kind of do the same thing again, a little more water, a little more Gremlins, it'll be great. And then in walks Star Magic Jackson Jr., and is like, I'm the Hollywood sequel doctor, and he just goes around the room and he's like, say a word. And someone's like, vegetables. Are you talking about a vegetable gremlin? Like an actual gremlin that turns into broccoli and runs around and is all crazy? It's in the movie. Next. <laughs> uh, and that it, they just go around the table and, and they name all of the literal actual gremlin ideas that are in that movie. Oh my God, that's hilarious. So it's really that's, wonderful. That's hilarious. Okay, so, so have to watch that. there you go. I want to do something not film related. You know what I'll do? Restaurant. Mm. We were talking about food earlier. Here's one. Uh, we had dinner at a restaurant called Bakari on West Third recently. B A C A R I Bakari on West Third. There's a few of them. Yeah, there's a few of them, and it was. And I'm I'm a I'm a big foodie. I'm a big foodie in L A. Um, I would say it was one of the most satisfying meals I've had in a very long time. It's small plates. It's probably the most romantic type of atmosphere because you're outside under this giant tree with mm-hmm. chandeliers hanging off of it. And it was just one of the best meals I've had. And there's literally an item on the dessert menu called the best cake I've ever had. That's literally what it's called. Mm-hmm. And it is a, I think it's, I think it's like a bacon date cake <laughs> that's warm with like raspberry <laughs> sauce. And it's just like, it is the best cake I've ever had. But the food was just, I mean, like, I have to go back. It was one of the best restaurants I've been to in an extremely long time. That's my plug. What's a cool place you go to to meet filmmakers at? Um, for drinks? 
or coffee. Drinks or coffee. Co- Let's drinks do coffee? both. Drinks. You had drinks. You had an answer, right? Drink. Yeah, drinks. Drinks. I do Don Sung Sa in Koreatown. So if you haven't been to Don Sung Sa and you've seen Deer Hunter, mm-hmm. it's like walking into. <laughs> it's like it's a Korean restaurant, but it looks like you're walking into like Vietnam. Mm-hmm. One of the best fucking interiors of any place I've ever seen. It's D A N S U N G S A Don Don Sung Sa, and it's in a jinkity strip mall you would never assume sure. and you walk inside and it's like you're in temple of doom and it's all like hardwood really dim smoke and steam everywhere people running around and it's like korean small plates and the soju is like three bucks for like a, 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 a tin of it and it's just a real because it, it, it immediately transports you into this mystical magical place right you're kind of already having it you're in a good mood already just oh my god it's, it's, and you're like and the yeah. menu's like on a wood block and there's like 500 items of food and you're like what the fuck is this so Don Sung Sa is always a great place for drinks. Coffee, I would say I love Bardana on Larchmont just because of the atmosphere. I would say coffee, coffee, my favorite, like if I'm going to just indulge myself and not have like a, a black coffee, Rubies and Diamonds. Which oh, is, man. Which you is, have the black coffee Hollywood and Rubies Boulevard. and Diamonds, well, actually. Well, I'm, I'm transitioning more into like nitro brew now because uh-huh. I, I was, yeah. was a big latte guy. Yeah. I'm not a big co- a coffee. was something I didn't have grow up. So like I'm making my way towards... You know, right. a, a, adult the coffee. More, uh, yeah, like adult pure. coffee. Yeah. yeah, not like, can I have the hot chocolate with like a little bit sure, of the coffee sure, syrup yeah. in there? Um, but Rubies and Diamonds on Sunset and Gower has a, a salted coconut cream cold brew. Oh, boy. Okay. It's like just, it's like, it's like a very yeah. sweet and salty cold brew that they make in house. And it is, uh, it's like rocket fuel first, yeah. but also yeah. it's fucking delicious if you like that salty and sweet flavor like a profile those two places are great for coffee for me yeah. yeah i met some people at rubies and diamonds i find they don't have as much seating as i would like especially the, since they're this, next door to viacom and noya house yeah, and all yeah these sure places yeah. where there's people that are trying to meet people sure yeah, sure yeah, you have to go to go during like all, random hours yeah, yeah just put like a couple like rec- booths and tables but right? that area yeah. is if you it's just designed want to people poorly because it's like a, it's like a snake and yeah, kind of yeah well yeah. yeah. oh, cool Lauren, um, what you got? I have two life hacks that apply to probably not that many people. <laughs> One is uh, I was we were watching Hulu the other day, and it was like, if you watch this two and a half minute ad, you, there will be no ads in the middle of the show mm-hmm. that you watch. You're watching. We're watching Better Things, which is also an yeah. awesome show. Um, and it was for this razor called Manscaped. That's mm-hmm. like literally the name of the company. It's like to shave your balls pretty much without nicking them and it's waterproof and you can use it in the shower and you can use it on your beard and all and it was this really it kind of seemed like they were like ripping off dollar shave club a little bit yeah like super low budget but really funny and offbeat and then i was like that kind of answers all my problems with my current razor so i go to their website and i'm like oh it's like 50 bucks not that bad whatever and i they have all these reviews on their website and I read all the reviews and they're all like four and a half stars, five stars, four stars, best razor I ever had. And one review is like, read the reviews anywhere but here. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, that, how, somehow that snuck yeah. in there. And I went to Amazon and I read the reviews and they were all like one star, two stars. So everyone's wow. like, balls nicked. Um, <laughs> so the tip, which is so obvious to everyone unless you're like a grandma or something, is like if you go to... If you see something cool and there's a lot of reviews on the site that makes it, sure. go to Amazon, look up the same item, and read the reviews there. Yeah, I mean, even the Amazon reviews, I think, are a little worrisome. Yeah, you, know? you should like make sure that it's not, if you're reading a review, it's not the only review that person has ever left. Right. You've, you've read this this now famous sugar-free Haribo gummy bear review <laughs> on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the one where there's this insane. It's like the tr- yeah. If you if you know if you if yeah, you yeah. haven't read it. There's one. If you haven't read it, you you should spend a whole episode of this just reading it aloud. There it's, you go. It's okay. fucking hysterical. I, I, the first time I read it, I literally, I think I almost peed in my pants. <laughs> almost oh, peed in I'll my pants. I'll take it out. There is yeah. that, like, a Three Wolf uh, t-shirt. Do you know that one yeah, on Amazon? Yeah. That there's just, like, uh, like literally, like, 10,000 people writing how amazing this t-shirt is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think they were kind amazing. of, like, around the same, yeah. same time. My other hack, it's, like, so uh, obvious. Why didn't you go to, like, wire cutter and look for ball trimmers? That I, I'm always oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah, wire cutter, that's a good... I thing. want, like, a recommendation. Like, I want, yeah. like, the New York Times best ball, ball trim. Wire cutter is a good you know, endorsement as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
This is like if you have little kids and they're like watching shows and they will complain if you like stop the show in the middle. Like it's so obvious, but just like fast forward the show to two minutes before the end. They won't even realize that you've done anything. And then in two minutes, they're done watching the show and then there's no fighting. So that's what I do anytime. That that trick is going to last for a couple of weeks more taps. Well, I don't know. At three and a half, she still can't tell that the story arc is totally messed up. (laughs) Um, when we skip from minute five of a 30 minute show to minute yeah. 28 it's gonna be hard when you do empire strikes back it's like whoa, whoa, whoa wait <laughs> was his father no no no, no it doesn't matter yeah. well yeah. the just trick just is try to find on netflix at least when you're fast forwarding it'll show you like a little thumbnail yeah. try to find like a similar looking scene this seems at the too end com- this is too complicated the beginning. this is too complicated I mean, when you have kids <laughs> you will realize this is necessary <laughs> A necessary evil of lying to your children. At this point, you're just like, the television hasn't existed yet. Right. I know your friends say they have, but they don't. Yeah, yeah. We don't have this thing. At our house, also, the Barbie show is broken officially on Netflix. (laughs) So it's just not working. Sorry. Um, (laughs) Anyhow, if we want to find out more about you and Defiant, uh, Defiant.LA, is that the website? There's no website. Oh. There's no website there. (laughs) You're like, okay. You just, uh, our listeners have been so excited the whole time. And then, the, wait, there's no website. There's no website. What are they going to do? Uh, How do people find you? Are you on there's, Twitter There's or an Instagram. There's an Instagram account. What which is, is at Defiant. It's, I think it's at Defiant.studios. Cool. There is a there is an email if you can find it online. IMDB Pro would be like how you would get contact info or no? I mean, we don't need I didn't that. say it, but you can find it on what you might assume to be the place where you'd find sure. it. But like yeah. if people want to see... I don't be bombarding No, but yeah, if yeah, people yeah, want to see that. what movies you're working on... Yeah, go on like IMDb. What, IMDb yeah. will have, yeah. I mean, everything Eric will... Eric B. Fleischman. Yeah, everything will be... Not the other Eric B. Fleischman, because there's so many of us. But um, yeah, IMDb, we should probably get a website at some point. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. good. It's Sounds a like good it's sign that you don't need one. Yeah. Um, Well, cool. If you have any questions for us or want to comment about anything we talked about, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 16262shoot1, and we will play it. And that is even more fun than an emailed question. You can find us across all social media at Just Shoot It Pod. I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow. This episode was edited by Sarah Weirda. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams, and you're listening to music provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.